I've tried to, I've tried to uh, avoid politics my whole life. I never considered myself as very good at it, and I really wasn't interested in it. But <clears throat> um, here's the thing. You really can't do public health research without uh, some involvement with, with ethics, just like you can't live without being somewhat involved sometimes with politics and ethics. Now, um, what's the politics, what's the ethics here? Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about a researcher who decided this vaccine is going to work. It's going to help people. And you know what? The review boards aren't letting me do my research. It's a travesty. It's unethical. And I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make this new vaccine available. It was a herpes vaccine. And I'll talk about it in just a few minutes. But before I do, I'm going to talk about a... Uh, one of my own stories. I understand from a personal perspective how difficult it can be to get through uh, human subjects review. <clears throat> when I was at Hopkins, I uh, did a, um, I did some consulting with the Maryland State uh, uh, Department of Public Safety. That included the Division of Corrections, the prison system. There was a day when I was driving out to a blood drawing event at one of the maximum security facilities. They called it the cut. It was about 1,600 uh, men. <clears throat> the cut was built back at Civil War era, literally. And we had to shut down that entire prison population, that 1,600 men. No, no more movement in, no more movement out. And we had to do three, <clears throat> three episodes of drawing blood on everybody because of syphilis. There was a syphilis epidemic going on. Now, if you look at the, um, the history of IV drug use and um, homosexual or uh, sex with men, sex with other men uh, by history coming into a prison system, IV drug use is admitted uh, in 25%. It's a little bit more when the, on the way out than it, on the way in, so evidence that there's clearly some use inside. But then the numbers of um, the history, the portion of men saying, I've had uh, sex with other men, is dramatically increased on the way out. In other words, something we all know, you see it in, in movies, etc. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sex, or at least there was 30 years ago, maybe not anymore, but there's a lot of sex that goes on between men in prison. Now, why am I getting into all of that? Again, I had to do the, um, the work on that syphilis outbreak, but here's the thing. Do you remember Bob, Bob Gallo? He uh, was one of the heads of the NIH for a while, and he became head of the NIH because of the announcement that I'm just about to tell you about. On the way down to that uh, blood drawing activity for syphilis, Bob, uh, I was listening to the radio, and it was a major public health announcement. He came on to announce that his lab at the NIH had discovered HTLV-3. HTLV-3, if you don't remember, was human T-cell lymphotropic virus uh, 3. In other words, at this point, now we call it HIV. It was the AIDS virus. At that point in time, AIDS was a big, big issue for the, and still is. I don't know of an issue that's more important for the health of this population, inmate population. Now, so you can imagine what was going on in my head. The most, we now have a test for the most important um, health determinant of this population, and we're shutting it down so we can test the entire population. We should start looking at that. Well, guess what happened? Uh, I did propose that. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it was a huge political topic. Uh, politically, uh, there were concerns about, are we putting men in prison and basically giving them a death sentence due to AIDS? Well, that uh, research proposal, because it had to do with inmates, went straight to the the Supreme Court of Human Subjects Review, it's the Human Subjects, or IRB, it's the uh, Human Subjects Review Board for the National Institutes of Health. And they, find, they did agree with me that that was critical to, to inmate health and it should be done. But it took them two years 
to agree to that research. Why did it take them so long? Well, you know, the people that participate in ethics reviews for research have to, they come from a different world from a lot of us. They come from a world where they've heard a lot in that world, and we know that it exists. Uh, man has abused man. Uh, captive populations have been abused and used as uh, laboratory research animals for years. In Nazi Germany, it was uh, it was a huge issue. It was done in um, uh, at Tuskegee Institute, even though these these men were not um, were not captive. They were, they just deceived them. So, coming from a history like that, somebody that works on an IRB or Human Subjects Review has to be paranoid. It, and it's not paranoia, it's, it's a concern. It's a valid concern. So again, I got my, my research done. It, has, it did have a huge impact on uh, health care and health and uh, prison policy for inmates in the country. But let's go back and let's look at what the New England Journal has to say about um, human subjects review. In fact, they had an editorial recently call, calling it a parallel universe. Did you know that there was a uh, clinical trial that was done on a live vaccine uh, for herpes? It was, uh, it's under investigation. It allegedly totally avoided Institutional Review Board. IRB is uh, what all researchers have to go through. It's to protect the participants in a clinical trial. The um, Principal investigator has died of cancer. Um, he actually evidently gave um, injections in a hotel off campus. This was at Southern Illinois University. The FDA is investigating this. Um, he actually then flew the 17 participants down to St. Kitts to inject them there as well. Um, <clears throat> interesting, huh? So I tried to, and this is not the uh, the vaccine that we did a series on. That was a that's a a killed vaccine with a lot of adjuvant stuff. That it's a very different vaccine. Went through a very different process. But <clears throat> while I was investigating uh, for that, I came across this, and there's actually an article in the recent New England Journal about this. As much as I hate to deal with politics, again, public health is. Uh, about health of the public, and uh, politics really gets involved in trying to manage and uh, have a positive impact on health. So what's going on here is this. Um, <clears throat> the bottom line is it's a, a, another argument between uh, free rights advocates or, or um, libertarian type of thought process versus uh, protection of public health. And we'll get into a little bit more detail in just a minute. But first, an uh, introduction. My name is Ford Brewer, F-O-R-D, Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R. -E and I give you a, a uh, mostly science, but sometimes uh, I'm giving a little bit of the political background associated with the things that disable and kill us. Uh, heart attack, stroke, those are the big disablers and killers. Um, a lot of information on cardiovascular inflammation, which is a, a, a big driver of this and uh, only now just becoming recognized as a big driver. Uh, we also look at cancers and we've done several uh, videos on um, herpes vaccine because uh, herpes is a significant disabler. If you don't know it, you maybe should look it up or, or look at some, some of our other videos. Um, <clears throat> The FDA launches criminal investigation into rational vaccines. That's the name of the company over under uh, unauthorized herpes research. So what happened here was uh, Dr. William Halford. Uh, this is actually again the new, recent uh, New England Journal of July twelfth. Actually, the first article: a parallel universe of clinical trials. Um, New England Journal of July 12th, 2018. And the parallel universe they're talking about is, again, the more um, 
right to try medications and procedures versus clinical trial uh, standards. So <clears throat> William Halford has a PhD or had a PhD in immunology and microbiology. He was faculty at University of uh, South Illinois. He developed this vaccine. It was a live virus vaccine for herpes and uh, injected himself, injected others, once in a hotel off campus and then evidently another time in St. Kitts. Um, maybe he got the idea that it would be safer to, uh, to do this unauthorized research offshore. He actually has some... Um, some investors had some investors with him. They're, I guess they're remaining with the company. The first is Augustine Fernandez the third. Augustine Fernandez the third says, <clears throat> "Look, um, he's uh, by the way uh, an Oscar-winning uh, film producer. Uh, Mr. Fernandez th says um, the film industry is good training for running a non-traditional pharmaceutical company." because it requires thinking out of the box. Peter Thiel, or Thiel, depending on how you pronounce it, is also an investor. Peter Thiel is a, uh, an outspoken critic of the FDA and has invested in the company. Now, he did stipulate later on that um, future studies adhere to FDA requirements. Now, this uh, story was broken by the Kaiser Health News. Um, Senator Chuck Grassley heard about it, and the uh, university launched a, um, an investigation. They found that he didn't use the IRB, uh, Institutional Review Board, didn't get review of the study, didn't go through either federal regulations, uh, follow re federal regulations, or a university uh, policy. But they do own the copyright. The university does own the copyright to the vaccine. Um, I'm not sure they're too proud of that ownership at this point. Um, <clears throat> since that uh, article was uh, published by the uh, Kaiser Health News, uh, the so Southern Illinois has launched an investigation um, which said he didn't follow what he was supposed to do, these regulations or our policies. The FDA has opened the investigation that I showed a few minutes ago on the, uh, on the first um, video or, or on the first uh, headline. No deaths or hospitalizations have happened yet um, other than Dr. Halford's death from an unre uh, seemingly unrelated cancer. Um, one uh, participant has said, you know what, my outbreaks of herpes have declined and actually even recently gone away. So there's a couple of people that are still <coughs> major proponents. Now, why is this a big deal? Well, <clears throat> we also covered things like uh, the food calorie labeling law, where again, there's a significant um, debate regarding uh, whether or not uh, the government should tell us how to practice medicine, tell patients what medicines they can take, um, tell food uh, manufacturers and sellers how to label their food and again the list goes on and on and on um, as I've mentioned and we all know um, believe it or not there's a lot of literature indicating that uh, helmet use within cars would cause a huge decrease in uh, uh, car crash fatality we know that debate just never happened. Uh, we know that the debate about helmets for motorcycles has happened. We know what happened there. Obviously, gun control laws uh, have happened. What's going to happen with random, randomized clinical trials? I don't know, but Dr. Ho, who wrote the article uh, for the New England Journal, said <clears throat> there's some good reasons why these, these people are um, arguing with clinical trials. Um, Number one, they say folks need liberty, which we, um, we already talked about. They say this assumes that you and your doctor are not smart enough to assess relevant data. Well, that does assume that. And personally, I think that's a, quite often an accurate thing. It, 
It doesn't assume that everybody does, but it assumes that enough people do that there would be harmful deaths. This actually reminds me of a novel that I remember reading as a teenager. It was an old classic novel. I can't remember it. I tried looking it up to, to show a picture of it, but it was, a, I think, a, a, um, a barber who decided he wanted to act like a doctor. He tied off uh, a, um, I think, a leg that was sick, and the leg gangrened, and I don't remember if it killed the patient or if they had to amputate, but it was it, it was very similar to to this issue. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the second issues they say is that the current FDA and IRB regulations harm patients by uh, withholding uh, helpful treatments. Again, <clears throat> I I understand that, and that clearly does happen, but uh, if we have no regulations around uh, clinical trial participation, we're not going to get any clarity regarding what actually works and what doesn't. And we'll have uh, popular treatments that hurt people. Uh, third, supporters of Halford believe that scientists whose work has been rejected by peer review or uh, violate regulatory requirements are actually courageous heroes. These folks, <coughs> um, uh, the president of the Foundation for Economic Education praised Hal Halford as a genius who challenged conventional wisdom, blazed new trails in scientific research, dedicated his life to helping others, developed promising new tools against a terrible affliction, and lighted a path for policy changes to end the suffering of millions. Hey, basically, <clears throat> um, you've got debate here, and you've got one side maybe doing a little bit better job in terms of developing stories, uh, reaching out to uh, the right constituents, and uh, getting uh, political airtime. <clears throat> Again, whether we like it or not, if we want to uh, improve the health of the public, sometimes we have to uh, play the political games. Thank you for your interest.